Okay, well, uh, I guess we're running a little bit late, but let us go on with the teaching. We are looking at a new, probably a new series called Open Fellowship, in which I speak about um, the ways that Christians are intended to hold to good things and intended to st keep their hands away from bad things. And uh, the opening thought in this is one of the more perhaps uh, complicated ones, but I hope that it is also one of the more interesting ones. So that's why we started with Jehoshaphat in Ahab's court. And, uh, you know, as an introduction to the idea of a lesson on fellowship, I would turn us to Hebrews 6 and 1 Timothy 5, and then we'll come back to our text in 2 Chronicles. But Hebrews 6 is where we begin with the idea of fellowship, which I will remind you in the New Testament is as often called fellowship as it is laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is fellowship from our perspective. It means you, you take hold of something. You, uh, in some sense, are... Um, perhaps inaugurating it or approving of it, putting it into place, installing it, appointing it. This is how the word laying on of hands is used in the New Testament, which is a different study, and I can provide those verses if you would like. But the point of Hebrews 6, or of us reading Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3 on this matter, is that it is elementary doctrine of Christ. The laying on of hands, the fellowship of uh, the saints, is elementary doctrine. It is foundation, as in uh, basic, uh, basic or elementary principles. So uh, the idea behind this is that, you know, it should be something that is learned early and is a fairly simple approach. And I think that it is simple. I think that uh, people have made it hard to understand because they're uncomfortable with what it means sometimes. <laughs> uh, but actually, it should be one of the first things. And everything else in that list that you read about, from resurrection from the dead to an impending judgment to uh, baptism, all the other things that are in this list in Hebrews 6, pretty much you would agree, everybody would agree is elementary. But for some reason, fellowship is not, is not considered in the number of elementary things. Also, 1 Timothy 5, verses 21 and 22, help us understand fellowship in the sense of laying on of hands being something that, um, well, involves a little bit more than you think. 1 Timothy 5, 21 and 22, Paul tells him, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you, keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So we have to, in this case, he's talking about correcting elders, uh, which is a serious thing. But what he's saying is you got to keep the rules without prejudging. That is, you don't decide before you get there. You need to hear both sides. You don't do things from partiality, decide on your favorites for whatever reasons. But then he goes on with this, which is pertinent to what we're saying. Don't be hasty laying on hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. Hasty laying on hands is the issue at hand, if you pardon the pun. We have to be careful about what we approve. We have to be careful about what we appoint or whom we appoint to do things, whether that's teaching or whatever it might be. Don't be hasty about that, nor take part in the sins of others, which is to say, if somebody is doing wrong or teaching error and you lay hands to that, say, well, this is a good one. Let's bring this one here to teach. Well, then you take part in what they're doing which is the opposite of keep yourself pure. That's the basic meaning behind the laying on of hands. It's what you approve um, matters. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Now, in our text, with regard to Ahab and Jehoshaphat, 
The prophet said to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 19.3, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? And I think that gets down to it when, it, when you're talking about fellowship. Should you help the wicked? Well, no. Should you love those who hate the Lord? You say, well, we love everybody. Yeah, I understand. But you know what he means when he says this. As in, well, what about those who love the Lord? How do you treat them? Why does this one get your favor? Who hates the Lord? Well, that's a good question. The fellowship, um, as it is used or as it is uh, done in the churches, is often along the wrong kinds of lines, more like what you see Jehoshaphat doing here than what the Lord said through his prophets. And that's why we study it. And yes, this uh, lesson is broken into sections, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've actually not seen the movie, so I hope it doesn't mean anything that terrible. They're just titles on sections. That was a movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think it was, well, like, anyway, one of those Western guys. The good. First thing is Jehoshaphat. He's supposed to be a good king. Second Chronicles 17, verses 3 through 6. Here are the good things, right? The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father, David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments. And he walked, verse 4, importantly, not according to the practices of Israel. He was a Judean king. He was faithful the way that David had been in that regard. Fifth verse of 2 Chronicles 17. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat. And he had great honors, great riches and honor. This is why he was established. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and the Asherim out of Judah. So this is a good thing. Jehoshaphat, in general, was a good king. We are going to study some of the things he did that were not good. But as a rule, he did what was right. And that's what the record is showing us. He certainly had his flaws. Um, and they, they're here, I think, to warn us and to show us how we ought to conduct ourselves. But he did pretty good in taking the high places away. Most of the kings didn't succeed in doing that. Not everywhere, but out of Judah anyway. The other good things that we note were uh, in the spirit, 2 Chronicles 17, verses 7 and 9, where in the third year of his reign, he sent his officials to teach in the cities of Judah. They taught in Judah, having the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went about through all the cities of Judah and taught among the people. That's an excellent thing for the king to be supporting and uh, putting forth. So this is all very good. The um, things that he has accomplished, therefore, when we speak about he walked in the ways of his father, David, he cleared out the idolatry. He taught the book of the law through Judea by um, officials. These are all very good. And they do leave you kind of scratching your head about the bad that we have to read. It's an interesting thing that you, in Chronicles, which is the spiritual record of the kings, it's always telling you, well, it does tell you what happened, but it's more about why did it happen. That's really what Chronicles is for. And it spends that 17th chapter talking about the good that he did, but the first verse of the 18th says, Jehoshaphat had great riches and honor, and he made a marriage alliance with Ahab. So immediately you're wondering, uh, you know, why would he do that? Why would he align himself with the king of Israel, not the not a good one, with Ahab of all things? So Jehoshaphat here is clearly making a mistake. A marriage alliance means that the two kings have agreed to allow their families to intermarry, which 
you know, in theory makes the the bond stronger and the relationship between the two stronger, blah, blah, blah. All those human things that people do with families. But why would you do that with the house of Ahab? The worst king in Israel's history. Up until that point, why would you do that? What's the point of making a marriage alliance with him? Why, why do you need that? First question, right? Then in, in verse 3, Ahab invites him to go to war. Will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered, I am as you are, my people as your people. We will be with you in the war. Now, uh, it's not unusual that you make an alliance with somebody and then you ask for a favor. And uh, Ahab is asking for a favor. I need support to go to war. Um, the thing that's troubling to me here is Jehoshaphat saying, I am as you are. That is not true. Jehoshaphat is a good king who fears the Lord and who walks in the ways of his father, David. Ahab is not even close to a good king. He's the worst king they've had in history. He is evil. He follows Baal. He has deputized Jezebel, who is terrorizing the prophets of the Lord. They're hiding in caves. So no, I am as you are. No, that's not true at all. He shouldn't say something like that. This is throwing what is holy to the dogs. It shouldn't be that like that. My people as your people, hardly. If you were in Judea at that time, you would say, well, no, no, I don't serve Baal. No, I don't worship at the cans of, uh, or at the uh, calves of Dan and Bethel. No, we're not the same. So this is becoming a problem for Jehoshaphat, you see. We have the marriage alliance, and now he pretends that they're the same thing. No, they're not the same thing. So we keep going to 2 Chronicles 18. In verse 4, Jehoshaphat told Ahab, inquire first for the word of the Lord. Let's see what God says about it. And Ahab trots out these prophets that he says are the Lord's prophets. No, they're not. They're Jezebel's boy toys whom she has used to supplant the actual prophets of the Lord who are in hiding. Jehoshaphat said, is there not here another prophet of the Lord of whom we may inquire? <laughs> there's not even, there's not any other prophet of the Lord here. This is the issue not here is what I've highlighted because where are you, Jehoshaphat? <laughs> Why would you think that there is going to be a prophet of the Lord here? Ahab is an enemy of the Lord. Jezebel is an enemy of the Lord. Why are you there? Of course, there's not here another prophet of the Lord, if you will. Well, there is one, right? Verse 7, the king of Israel said, there's yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, Micaiah, son of Imlach, but I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. So Ahab said, yeah, there's one more. We didn't ask for his opinion. We didn't invite him here. We don't usually bring him out into mixed company to people with good manners, right? Because I hate him. He never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. Could it be that this is because Ahab is always doing evil and not what is good? That's the problem. It's not the prophet. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. That's just not the best response, is it? That's not very strong. Jehoshaphat himself did what was right, as is recorded for us clearly. But when it came to these matters of laying hands to something prematurely, not really understanding the consequences and ramifications of it, he really messed up. He shouldn't be in this court. Well, Micaiah delivers in the 16th verse. <laughs> I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. This is the vision of what happens when Ahab goes to war, the king of Israel. I saw Israel scattered like sheep with no shepherd. And the Lord said, they have no master. What does that mean? That means Ahab's dead. 
Go to Ramoth Gilead to die, Ahab. That's what the prophet said. And it was true. That is exactly what happened. So then, in the 17th verse, the king of Israel told Jehoshaphat, didn't I tell you he wouldn't prophesy good concerning me, but evil? This is the, I told you so. It is uh, the, um, it's the hypochondriac's tombstone. I told you so, you know. <laughs> the king of Israel said, didn't I tell you he was going to say nothing good, just evil? He already knew that they would not have approval from the Lord. Why didn't Jehoshaphat know that they would not have approval from the Lord? Why was he there? 27th verse, Micaiah said, if you return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he turned to everybody in the court, hear all you peoples. I mean, other nations were here too, listening to this conversation. Uh, Jehoshaphat's influence should have been, this is evil. We will not do what, you know, I will not do what the Lord has forbidden. But that's not what he did. What he did was go to war at Ramoth Gilead with Ahab. So he said, inquire of the Lord first. Ahab trots out these false prophets, which Jehoshaphat seems to recognize that they are false prophets and says, hey, don't we have a, a real prophet and yeah, we got one, but I hate him. And he comes out and says, don't go. Well, why did you ask for the prophets of the Lord in the first place? And uh, the, um, the answer of Jehoshaphat to this is not to listen to what God said and refuse to go. He goes anyway. But that is a problem. And I know you have a comment, Nico, but I'm I'm supposed to be preaching. It's not discussion. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, so the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat went up. Skip a little, brother, to the 19th verse, 19th chapter, rather. Ahab did get killed, but Jehoshaphat made it in safety back to the, his house in Jerusalem. However, Jehu, son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to the king, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. So the prophet is sent to tell Jehoshaphat something about what he has done by going to the house of Israel and by going to war with Ahab. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? The answer to this is obviously no. You should not have been helping Ahab. You should not be showing favoritism with a marriage alliance to a house that hates the Lord. They don't love the Lord. They hate the Lord. They fight the Lord at every turn. Because he has done this, not that he himself did wickedness, or that he himself hates the Lord, or that he himself worshipped at the altars um, of the green places, or uh, stood up a pillar of Asherim. He didn't do any of those things. What did he do? Well, he helped the wicked and went along with those who hate the Lord. This is laying hands hastily. He has a fellowship problem. These are not supposed to be his fellows. They don't have in common what he thinks they have in common. Because of this, wrath has gone out. Nevertheless, some good is found in you, for you destroyed the Asheroth out of the land and have set your heart to seek God. So God is being merciful to Jehoshaphat. He didn't do right in this. It takes him a little bit of time to learn his lesson. God is showing mercy to him. He's saying some good is found, so he's getting a little bit more time here. If you move forward to the 20th verse with this, you start to see some other things happening. Jehoshaphat in 35, I'm sorry, 20th chapter, verse 35, 6, and 7. Jehoshaphat joined with Ahaziah, 
king of Israel, Ahaziah is Ahab's son, who acted wickedly. Ahaziah acted wickedly. Not Jehoshaphat himself doing the wickedness. Ahaziah was wicked. But Jehoshaphat joined him. He joined him building ships to go to Tarshish, and they built the ships in Ezion Geber. Then Eliezer, a prophet, prophesied against Jehoshaphat in verse 37. Because you have joined with Ahaziah, the Lord will destroy what you have made. The ships were wrecked and not able to go to Tarshish. You see the emphasis here is on you have joined with Ahaziah. The ships are not necessarily a bad thing. The crew on the ship is not a bad thing. What they were planning to do in and of itself, going to Tarshish, whatever it was they were trying to do, uh, apparently to get some gold. Um, that's not in and of itself a wrong thing or a bad thing to do. The problem here is that he joined with Ahaziah. So I want to get that across for this lesson on fellowship, which is the first one that, you know, Jehoshaphat as a rule is a good king and a good guy who is not himself engaging in some overtly evil thing. But this is evil. He shouldn't be joining with Ahab. And when he does, the Lord is angry with him. If you look over to this account in 1 Kings uh, 22, you can see Jehoshaphat made ships of Tarshish to go to Ophir for gold, but they didn't go because they were wrecked as young Geber. But there's more information in 1 Kings 22, 49. That's the important verse. Then Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, let my servants go with your servants in the ships. As in... <laughs> You guys wrecked it. If you will let my people go with yours, if you let me put a crew on there with your crew, they'll make it this time. This is very interesting, but Jehoshaphat was not willing. So what you're seeing in 1 Kings 49 is two things. In retrospect, Jehoshaphat was not willing, as in when it wrecked and he had heard from the prophet that that was going to happen, he knew, I'm not supposed to be joining with Ahaziah. I'm not, we're not going to try this again. It's done. So that's good. He learned his lesson. But the other thing is very subtle, is that until then, he didn't let Ahaziah's servants go with his servants in the boat. He seemed to have some kind of a sense that he shouldn't be in an alliance with Ahab's family. He didn't want them to be so intermingled and so intermixed that they were on the same ship working together to the same goal. He was just kind of, you know, collaborating alongside in something that seemed like a good idea. But this is his way of thinking that he's dealing with his fellowship problem by saying, well, but they, they have to be, you know, they have to be separate. <laughs> that doesn't clear him of having made a joint agreement together with a son of Ahab. And this is the thing that people miss. Um, they know it's wrong, but they go ahead and find a way to do it where they can kind of put some layers of indirection between here and there. So you can't quite tell the source of the money or you can't quite tell the source of the idea or of the authority for the thing being done, but you can't fool the Lord. The Lord knows. So he went into this thinking he could limit this by keeping the servants separated from each other, but no, it's still something he did with Ahaziah. And the Lord still condemned it, and that ship wrecked. And this tells you, too, that it was Jehoshaphat's servants who died. All right, so there's that. Now, um, I think we should do the next part of this lesson 
at the next time that we come together, because it's at least as long as what we have covered now. <laughs> well, let's do that and pause here and come back. We just got through the good and the bad, right? Yep. I find it concerning with the uglies about the same length as good as the good and the bad together. It the is. Least guys and all, the least helpful guys in all of human history. Oh, yeah. I know. Uh, well, no, that's that's not it. So, well, I, I mean, if you want me to, t- to keep teaching, I'll keep teaching. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, I think we should stop for the I moment. Have, I have a yeah. Well, I, I'm happy to teach. Uh, I just want to get back home. Culture brother is still sick. Yeah. Still it's a reasonable. Yeah, but I don't know if she needs anything. This is the usual amount of time I spend on the sermon. I usually wrap it about here. So this is okay. That's enough to think about for now. We'll come back. What is the ugly? Perhaps you can read ahead and look, see what happened. What became of Ahab's marriage alliances? What happened because of this? After Jehoshaphat was gone. Because that's the ugly. Mm -hmm. It's true that it was the worst disguise in history. And that's kind of like he like beclowned himself. <laughs> Is that a word you just used, beclowned? Yeah, he just beclowned himself, like agreeing to go into battle dressed as Ahab in Ahab's war. Like, what? Something that he really had no reason for. In the first like, this makes no sense. And it's you're Ahab. right. That's ridiculous. But I'm telling you, it's not at all the worst thing. The worst thing is what happens to it's, his family because of the alliances that he made. It's not the worst thing. It's just the stupidest thing. It was pretty stupid. It's kind of humorous. In a way. Shouldn't laugh at this or we'll have a bone to pick with you. A humorous bone, perhaps. And so we move on. Um, the thing is the consequences to his family are dire that's the point yes they're destroyed by his alliances they destroy one another the women that he brought from ahab taught his sons all kinds of evil things according to the house of ahab not the way that jehoshaphat wanted it done and it's always that way you don't control the genie once you let it out of the bottle You have fellowship with error. You have fellowship with sin. You you bring in false teachers. You tie yourself to organizations and philosophies and and, uh, ways of thinking in the churches that are not scriptural. And yeah, you're going to have problems. There's going to be big problems. That's what we're getting at. So we'll have to talk about it at the next opportunity. But today we also talk about salvation. If any have not obeyed the gospel, and realize that you stand in need before God. We are happy to help you with uh, coming to the water to be buried in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. If today you as a Christian have not been living right, we will be glad to help you with coming to God in prayer. And we pray for you and for ourselves too, because we are not above temptation. If you need the prayers of the saints, or if you need to be baptized in his name, For forgiveness of sins, please let your need be known while we sing Song of Invitation.